Hello there, faithful listener. You've tuned in to Season 7 of the Bible Explained Podcast. So make sure to grab your cup of coffee, because today we are going to be discussing the Book of Acts. Hello, faithful listener, and welcome to the Bible Explained Podcast on this lovely, lovely Thursday morning. It is finally sunny out here where I'm at. Hopefully the weather has been good for you guys as well. But today we're going to be discussing Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 11 today. And even though it's a very short portion of scripture, there is a lot to talk about here because we're going to be talking about the Old Testament law and whether or not the Old Testament law should still be followed today and if we even need the Old Testament law. So let's get into this. I'll be reading Acts 15, 1 through 11, and I'm very excited to announce that I am back to drinking coffee in the morning. So uh, I'm, I'm happy again that I'm able to drink coffee. But make sure to grab your cup of coffee or your cup of tea this morning for you crazy tea drinkers out there. And let's go ahead and read Acts 15, 1 through 11 out of the W.E.B. or the version that you prefer. So men came down from Judea and taught to the brothers, unless you are circumcised after the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small discord and discussion with them, they appointed Paul and Barnabas and some of the others of them to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. They, being sent on their way by the assembly, passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversation of the Gentiles. They caused great joy to all the brothers. When they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the assembly and the apostles and the elders, and they reported everything that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to see about this matter. When there had been much discussion, Peter rose up and said to them, brothers, you know that a good while ago, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the nations should hear the word of the good news and believe. God, who knows the heart, testified about them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just like he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God that you should put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. So you can see the problem that some people might have with this portion of scripture, right? Because it almost seems like what's the point of the Old Testament if it's just a yoke like Peter talked about and how it's so hard to bear and how even the Israelites couldn't bear it and now the Gentiles can't bear it. What is the point of the Old Testament? But before I answer that, let's go back to verse one. It says, some men came down from Judea and taught to the brothers. Unless you are circumcised after the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. So you can see how that is a huge problem, that there's these men coming down from the region of Judea to Antioch, which is where this church was. And don't forget, Antioch was the biggest Gentile church of this time period. It was like the first Gentile church, and it had a lot of Gentile members. And it was started by Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas were there at that church during this time period because that was kind of like their home church. So these guys come down from Judea to spread this message that Gentiles cannot be saved unless they are circumcised by the Old Testament standards. Now, if you're wondering what this is referring to, circumcision was the first covenant God ever made with the Israelite people because he made it with the founder of the Israelite nation, which was Abraham. So Abraham was like the first patriarch of Israel. So God came down to Abraham and was like, I have set you apart. You are different among everybody else. And I am going to someday bless your descendants greatly. And so God and Abraham like made this covenant or this promise with each other. And so God made a promise that he was going to bless Abraham's children. And in response, God commanded Abraham to get circumcised because circumcision was not something that people ever did, right? Because who would think to do that, you know, to circumcise yourself? So God explained circumcision to Abraham and Abraham did it. He circumcised himself and he circumcised all the men of his household. Now, this was only for men. Okay, God never commanded circumcision for women at any point in time ever. So circumcision kind of became 
the custom for Israel because God commanded it from Abraham and from Abraham's descendants. So all of the Israelites, to show that they were different from the nations, would circumcise their male babies on the seventh day, I believe, after they were born. And even Jesus went through the circumcision process, right? When he was seven days old, his parents took him to the temple and uh, he got circumcised on the seventh day. So it was a covenant that God made with his people. And that's why circumcision was so important to Israelites. And to this day, it is still very important to Israelites because it's the first covenant. So these men are coming down from Judea to teach the Greeks and the Romans and the Gentiles who are at this church in Antioch that they are not saved unless they go get circumcised. So it says in verse two that Paul and Barnabas had no small discord and discussion with them. So basically, Paul and Barnabas are like, no, this is not true. Circumcision is not what saves you. And so there's this big discussion. And it sounds like an argument kind of broke out between Paul and Barnabas and these men that were teaching this stuff to the Greeks. And so you can see how this would cause a big problem because these Greeks, these Gentiles at Antioch are thinking that they're saved, thinking that they're doing the right thing. And now they're like, oh, my gosh, what if we're not saved? And so the men from Judea are, are spreading the seed of doubt with the Gentiles being like, no, you're not actually saved. You have to do this along with your belief in Jesus to achieve salvation. Now, we know that from the gospel message, we know that this is not true. Like you and I reading the Bible, we know that the only way we can become saved is through the grace of Jesus. You know, there's nothing that you and I can do, nothing at all that can save us. And so circumcision obviously does not save us. But at this point in time, the people, the Jews specifically believing that the Old Testament was still the way of salvation were probably very confused on this issue. And it is a confusing issue because to this day, people are still confused about the role of the Old Testament. There's actually a group of Christians, I forget the name of them, but there's a group of Christians who follow the Old Testament and they're not Messianic Jews, by the way, they are like a sect of Christianity who they like wear tassels and stuff like the Old Testament tells them to do. And they wear like certain things and they don't eat certain foods and they try to follow the Old Testament as closely as they possibly can in the modern day. And so there is a lot of confusion with the Old Testament. And obviously, you know, the Jews at this time, they're probably very confused about the Old Testament because it's hard to accept that there's nothing we can do to attain salvation. It is hard to accept. And yet that's what it is. There is nothing we can do to attain salvation. It is all through God's love of you and of me. That is how we attain salvation is through God and just believing in the message of Jesus. So Paul and Barnabas, after having this big discussion, it says that the church actually appointed Paul and Barnabas and a few other people to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this issue with the apostles in Jerusalem. So this would be like Peter, James, and all the other disciples, right? So Paul and Barnabas, it says, on their way up to Jerusalem, they travel through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversation to the Gentiles and discussing it with them. And it actually says that the this conversation caused great joy with the Gentiles. So maybe... Um, they were also confused on this issue as well. The Gentiles in these two regions, they might have been like, oh, my gosh, we do have to keep the Old Testament law and we have to get circumcised and we have to believe in the message of Jesus. And so Paul and Barnabas explaining to them, like, no, you don't have to like you have to believe that Jesus is going to save you. That is the only way you can achieve salvation. So this causes great joy with the Gentiles who now they don't have to, you know, basically convert to Judaism in order to become a Christian. So it says that finally Paul and Barnabas arrive in Jerusalem and they were received by the assembly and the apostles and the elders and they reported everything that God had done with them. So first they're having like a great party, you know, Paul and Barnabas are in Jerusalem and there's like a welcoming party and they're talking about everything God had done up in the Gentile regions and all the cool things God was doing. And it says after a while, though, they start talking about the issue. And so some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, 
rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now you can see here, it's the Pharisees that are saying this, the believing Pharisees. This means that these Pharisees believed in Jesus, but yet they were still holding to the Old Testament law because that was what they grew up on. You know, that was their way of salvation in their minds. And so they're having a very hard time, as you can see. And so they're like, no, absolutely. These men are telling the truth from Judea. They're telling the truth that these Gentiles need to be circumcised and need to keep the Old Testament law in order to achieve salvation through the grace of Jesus. So finally, it says, after much discussion, Peter rises up in verse seven and he says, brothers, you know that a good while ago, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the nations should hear the word of God and the good news and believe. And I think what Peter is, I think what Peter is referring to here is when Jesus appointed Peter as the rock, you know, the rock in which the church was going to be built on, which was pretty true. Peter is basically known as the founder of the church. I think the Catholic faith believes that Peter was the first pope. And not to mention, Peter is called basically the evangelist to the Jews. It's kind of like Peter's title. And Paul was the evangelist to the Gentiles. So yes, Peter played a huge role, a very pivotal role in the founding of the early church. And so Peter is reminding, you know, the, the elders and the Pharisees and whoever is gathering in this room that he is the mouthpiece of God as stated by Jesus. And so he says, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, that the nations should hear the word of the good news and believe God who knows the heart testified about them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just like he did to us. I like that he's calling Jesus God here because I think a lot of people struggle in the New Testament with Jesus not calling himself God, even though he did many, many times. Like if you read back to the root words of the Greek, Jesus absolutely called himself God multiple times. That was what the entire book of John was about, Jesus being God. But because Jesus doesn't specifically say the words, I am God in the English language, I think people struggle with that. And Peter is calling Jesus God here. He says, God, who knows the heart, testified about them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just like he did to us. So it says, God made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. And that is the most important thing that Peter says here. He's like, the Gentiles have been saved. And he says, God made no distinction between the Gentiles and the Jews. And I'm sure that this was very hard, you know, for some of the Pharisees to hear because the Pharisees had the Old Testament. They believed that they were the source of salvation to the nations. And from the very beginning, God did give the Old Testament law to the Israelites because the Israelites were supposed to teach the other nations about the holiness of God. Like that was the point. But the Israelites failed at that over time. But because the Pharisees have the Old Testament and the Gentiles didn't, you know, the Pharisees were probably struggling with this, that God made no distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. So he says, their hearts have been cleansed by faith. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God that you should put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So you guys know what a yoke is like a yoke is something that is like strapped on an oxen, right, to pull them along, to lead them. And it's kind of heavy and it just makes the oxen like be able to plow right in a straight line. And so that's what a yoke is. And in a sense, when Peter says that the Old Testament is a yoke, it doesn't mean it's not a good thing. But in a sense, people were unable to bear it. They were unable to keep it. As you guys know, we're reading through the Old Testament on the Old Testament side of things on the podcast. And already you can see so many ways in which the Israelites were just unable to keep the law. Like they just constantly fell away from the law over and over and over again. And so Peter, he says, we weren't able to bear it. And so why are you trying to, to put that same law on these Gentiles when we weren't even able to bear it ourselves? But in verse 11, he says, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. And you know, Peter does mention something here. 
in verse eight, he says, the Holy Spirit was given to them just like he was given to us. And Peter is referring to, actually, I think the time when Peter himself, you know, he saw that vision coming out of the sky. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And Peter went to the home of like a Roman centurion and the Roman centurion received the Holy Spirit. And Peter was like flabbergasted that the Holy Spirit would come to like a Roman household. Peter was flabbergasted. And yet the Romans in that household, they weren't they weren't circumcised. The men weren't circumcised in that household. Certainly not. And they weren't keeping the Old Testament law. They were Gentiles. They were not Jewish converts or anything like that. And yet the Holy Spirit came to that household. And so Peter is referring to that in verse eight. He says, the Holy Spirit gave himself to the Gentiles just like he did to us. So why are we teaching that the only way the Gentiles can become saved is through circumcision and keeping the Old Testament law? It's just not true because already it's been disproven by the Holy Spirit himself. So this brings me to what is the purpose of the Old Testament? And you guys might be wondering that, like if the Old Testament has been, quote unquote, erased from the New Testament, which is what a lot of people believe, what is the point of the Old Testament? Well, first and foremost, it hasn't been erased because it's still there. We still have it. We still read it. And it's still important to this day for us to read. So I went over to gotquestions.org, which is like one of my favorite places. Like if I have a specific question, they they give you like a really good biblical answer and it's very short and to the point. So gotquestions.org says that the purpose of the Mosaic law from the Old Testament is to one, reveal the holy character of God, two, to set apart the nation of Israel, three, to reveal the sinfulness of man, four, to provide forgiveness through the sacrifice offerings, five, to provide a way for of worship to the community through the feasts and all that. Six, to provide God's direction for the physical and spiritual health of the nation. And then seven, to reveal to humanity that no one can keep the law, but everyone falls short of God's standard of holiness. So that's the purpose of the Old Testament law. It was to show how powerful God really is as compared to humans. It was to show how humans can't keep the Old Testament law. In other words, there's no way of salvation other than through the grace of Jesus. And thirdly, it was for, you know, basically Israel to be healthy and set apart from the nations. So I think that to this day, the Old Testament is still important and that Christians should be understanding the Old Testament law. Because firstly, the Old Testament law reveals the holy character of God. And it is so important for us Christians to understand the holy nature of God if we are going to worship God. And the Old Testament law really reveals God's character and how holy he really is. Secondly, to set apart the nation of Israel as distinct from the other nations. You know, even though the Old Testament law was given to the Israelites, us Christians now, we are considered God's people. The Gentiles have been grafted in along with the Israelites. So we are all part of God's people if we worship Jesus. So the Old Testament law shows us ways that we can live distinctly from other people, especially when it comes to morality. And I would argue that the morality laws to this day, we are still supposed to be keeping because even Paul says that. Even Paul says, you know, the morality issues of the Old Testament are still the same today. And so anytime there's a morality law in the Old Testament, it should be kept. Like, for example, the morality laws are like, don't kill people. (laughs) Don't cheat on your husband or wife. You know, obey God. Don't worship other idols. Those are the morality laws I am talking about. And uh, to this day, yes, we should be keeping those morality laws laws that are stated both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the other laws of the Old Testament, for example, the ceremonial laws about like cleansing and, you know, everything like that. And then like the judicial and civil laws, which were specifically for the nation of Israel at those time periods. We don't have to follow those laws anymore because they have been fulfilled completely by Jesus. And that's why we don't do animal sacrifices to this day. And like I said, Paul when we get more into his writings, you know, Romans and all of that, he's going to go a lot more into detail about 
those aspects of the Old Testament law. And then thirdly, the Old Testament law shows the sinful nature of humans and how we just can't keep the Old Testament law and how we need a savior. And that is also one of the reasons why Christians should be studying and understanding the Old Testament law. So yes, the Old Testament law is still important to this day, but it did not provide salvation to the nations. Only Jesus's blood could do that. So the Old Testament laws, they are not what grants salvation. And that is what Peter says here in Acts chapter 15, that even though the Old Testament law was good and the Old Testament law should still be studied to this day, it is not what saves. The only thing that can save is the grace that Jesus gives us. So people, the the Gentiles didn't have to get circumcised. They didn't have to follow the cleanliness laws of the Old Testament or whatever else the Pharisees wanted the Gentiles to do. They didn't have to do any of that. All they had to do was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they would be saved. So I could have talked about this topic for probably another like four hours and still not covered everything because it is a very in-depth and detailed subject. And it does confuse a lot of people to this day, whether or not we should be following the Old Testament laws. But in a nutshell, yes, the Old Testament is still important and we should still be reading it and, you know, following the morality of the Old Testament and the New Testament. But no, the Old Testament does not need to be kept to a T in order for us to be saved. The only thing that can really save us, not even the morality laws of the Old Testament, by the way, the only thing that can save us is the grace of of Jesus Christ. And so just be thankful that you have that freedom to be a Christian because, you know, Jesus's grace is very, very freeing. You know, we don't have to follow little set rules or anything like that in order to go in heaven. And that is what is so different about Christianity, by the way. <clears throat> it's so different because, you know, any other world religion you look at, you have to do like specific things in order to achieve their version of salvation. But in Christianity, you can't really do anything to achieve salvation other than believe in Jesus. Now, after you believe in Jesus, of course, you're going to want to change your lifestyle and you're going to want to live more like Jesus in every way that you can. But it's not what saves us. The only thing that saves us is the wonderful grace of Jesus. So friends and faithful listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, please rate it and share it on your social media platforms. But guys, I'll see you all tomorrow for an episode out of First Samuel. And we will be talking more about Hannah's story and the birth of Samuel. Guys, I'll see you tomorrow, 6 a.m. or whenever you choose to wake up. Happy listening and God bless. Ooh.